attendance at the Red Bull Music Academy 2011 World Tour. Red Bull Music Academy is an annual event that takes place in a different city across the world. Uh, they've been doing it for, I think, how many years now? 13 years? So um, this year they wanted to do something special, take it on the road and do events in cities around the globe within a very short time span. And of course, couldn't do that without visiting New York City. Yes, why not? Come on. Just give me a New York, it's a point. Um, this series specifically is entitled the Five Out of Five series. New York City being the birthplace of hip hop. Five boroughs, five classic hip hop albums, five public conversations about the making of those albums, as well as some performances by those artists. And uh, we're very excited and honored to have our very, very special guest here today to talk about his debut album from 1988. So, ladies and gentlemen, won't you please join me in welcoming the one and only Slip Rick. Check, check. How are you doing today, sir? I'm all right, Jeff, what's up? Um, it's, it's a great honor to have you here in the Bronx, where I do believe it's said that people are fresh. Yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, tell me what the Bronx means to you. You were not born in the Bronx, however. Right. This has been your home for some time. Um, uh, the Bronx is like, like the birthplace of hip hop. It's a multicultural place, like a lot of Latins, mixed with blacks. You know what I mean? And um, we just had fun break dancing, doing our thing, growing up, you know what I mean? Hip hop became a toy for us instead of graffiti and all the rest of that stuff. And um, we just worked it to where it is now, you know? So it's just a, a nice cultural thing. You know? <laughs> what was your first memories of, of encountering hip hop as, you know, as a kid living here, moving here from England? Uh, I guess it was the big, the big boom boxes. Um, with the, the older brothers that have the big boom boxes and they would be playing like uh, Breakbeat Records, Daisy Lady, uh, Impatient President, and whatever was, was happening, you know what I mean? And back and forth mixing it like that. And on the back of the trains and stuff like that, and it was just very stimulating, you know what I mean? It was like meat and potatoes, you know what I mean? So pretty much it was like taking whack records and taking the meat and potatoes and then keeping it moving like that. So, and then wrapping on top of it, so it was like, Pure meat and potatoes, you know what I mean? There used to be a group called Daisy Ladies and so I remember them, they used to be hot because females, you know, the whole tough what's the what's the look I'm saying? Uh, the the tomboy look was hot back then, you know what I mean? And um, everything was flavor, you know? So like if you're in a small community where you have little options, you know, you get to draw it on the walls and doing little things with your body to make yourself different from everybody else or whatever, your raps, whatever's clever, you know what I mean? So it was a fun time for us, yeah. Where'd you grow up um, in, the, in this area? I grew up um, 233rd Street, 241st Street, it's a little further up, all the way up in the north. Um, but I used to play around here because it's more stimulating, you know? <laughs> now you've obviously inspired many people to pick up the mic and become MCs. Who were some of the people inspired you back then? Uh, the Cold Crush Brothers inspired me the most because they have routines and they picked in, had to pick good records to rap on and um, they, they pretty much come from the Bronx so you know they did their things in the schoolyard so it's all free so we get to see a lot of stuff or hear a lot of stuff loud which is you know also very stimulating you hear the whole thing real loud in the streets you know what I mean it was like a lot of fun so Cold Crush Brothers I'd have to say was one I'd have to say Busy B, you know, with his mom, did he want to bang the bang. And um, that was pretty much it for me for the Bronx here. Yeah. Now, you know, perfect that you should mention those guys because, you know, anybody who studies the music and knows the history and knows your catalog can sort of see some of that influence from, say, a Cold Crush as singing routines or a, a Busy B or a Grandmaster Kaz storytelling and you know for storytelling I mean for a lot of us hip-hop is storytelling is divided between before Slipperick and after 
So how did that develop for you, the signature sort of style of yours? Well, I, when I was going to high school, I used to like to, uh, English was probably my favorite subject, so you know, you study essays, how you write an essay, you have your beginning, then you have your body, and then you have your end, like the teacher teach you, you know? So that's pretty much what rap was. It was like three verses, story style. You start with the beginning, what you're gonna talk about, then you get the body is what this, you know, the whole thing, and then the end is like even a message, like, like a belly bells, don't push me, because I'm close to the edge, or whatever. But whatever, you know which one's on, right? So, pretty much it was like an essay, you know? So we write like essays, I write like essays, stories with mostly positive endings or whatever, like a case like that. That's pretty much my style, like that. And humor, though it's some humor, you know, kids, you know how good. Yeah. Always humor, yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, the Kango crew, for those who may not be aware of who those folks are, where, how that crew formed. Kango crew was basically a high school group. Dana Dane was one of the members. We was just, we didn't have turntables and mixes and all that stuff. We was, we wasn't that, we was poor. So we just banged on the desk and made up cute routines and you know, while with the whole school with our little routines. We went to music and art, you know, multicultural school, you know? And um, so we used to just bang on the desk and make these cute routines and stuff, you know? And then we used to wear the hat Kango because Kango was part of the fashion of the game, you know? Anything to make yourself, anything to sell yourself, you know, sexy, whatever, you know? So we had the candles and the suit jackets, and we used to just play around like that, you know? Then when we got famous, we took it to the TVs. Yeah. Um, now, was Dane, was Dana Day rhyming the way he's known to be rhyming? I mean, that seems like right. it's your influence on him, because well, he's, he's from Brooklyn originally, yeah. right? Yeah, Dana's from Fort Greene. Um, they didn't used to rap like that. It was it was the the, um, the industry that pushed it to sound like something that sells already. You know what I mean? They said, well, if this sells, then you should sound similar with an English accent or you know whatever clever. So he did what he had to do to get his foot in the door. You know what I mean? So whatever's clever like that. What was the first reaction from folks when you started rhyming back then? You know, even before records with your voice sounding the way it sounds, so unique. Right. Well, before, it didn't sound, I had a, a high-pitched voice like a girl, because, you know, voice didn't change it, you know what I mean? So, nobody wasn't, nobody wasn't checking for the kid like that, you know what I mean? It was like, whatever, you know, it's cute, whatever, whatever. But then as he grew, and the act, you know, after high school, and the accent, I mean, and the maturity, and the voice came out with the English accent, or whatever, it was clever, it all worked together like that, you know? Rap on, and, you know, fashion, you gotta have the fashion mastered, you know what I mean? Like, like I said, the Kangos, the Clock Wallabies. Before the Clock Wallabies and the Kangos, it was Adidas and Pumas and um, Proquettes, Mark Nex, Silver Medallions, and stuff like that. But then the Bronx moved on, well, not really Brooklyn too, you know, with the Jamaican, the Clock Wallabies, and the, the whole suit pants and the, the, the slacks and the shirt, it was just like a mature look, so it looked good on a young person, because you know, you look better when you're young trying to look old than if you're old trying to look old, or you know? <laughs> So, it looked slick to see a young kid wearing shoes and slacks and dress shirts with a, you know, a little stylish piece of jewelry here and there, a little kango and little glasses to sell yourself, yeah. You rocking the sunglasses back then? When did you? Um... Well, I used to wear like a contact lens. Anything that camouflaged, you know, the eyes, because the eyes is kind of messed up, you know what I mean? And then, gradually I just started wearing, I was wearing the Ray-Bans for a while. And then after a while, I just said, I'm just gonna wear the patch. And then the patch seemed to caught on, you know what I mean? So I just stuck with the patch. Sometimes I wear the glasses, but you know, most people prefer the patch. How did you meet Dougie Fresh? Uh, I met Dougie Fresh at 170th Street, uh, Jerome Avenue, at this uh, rap battle that was happening over there. These, uh, these rap contests in the Bronx where they would get all the people together to see who was the best and whoever went get $1,500 and a little recognition. So Doug was already established, so he was one of the judges. So me and this other kid from my school named John Porterfield, Died. God bless my 
he was in the contest, so I just went to, to just play around, and he invited me on stage with him, and then we just did our thing. You know what I mean? Cold Crush just did that record, so he'd go and he'd perform, you know, do his little thing. Uh, he was hit by his own joy, I think, at that time already, right? He would be boxing and just having fun yeah, and right. stuff like that. Um, do you remember what you kicked that day that impressed Dougie? Um, ooh, not really. It might have been, it might have been Peace of Lottie Lottie or something like that, you know? Can't recall too clearly, but whatever it was, it, it made an impression. So once you, once you guys formed together, Get Fed, right. Get Fresh crew, <clears throat> I guess just tell us a little bit about how that all started to come together leading up to the single you guys recorded. Uh, well, Doug used to carry me around with him to when he was doing his shows, and he would just like highlight me or something on the show, like he does with Little Vicious and stuff. So I would just come out and you know do my little lottie dottie or whatever, some small routine to make the crowd. First they would look at you like whatever, you know, skinny and nerd, trying to get put on whatever. But then when you kick their humor and they got to laugh and enjoy themselves, that guy is, you know, insult itself. So it was like, yeah, it's an asset. I became an asset to the to that show, you know.